Okay, so um, we have uh, quite a bit of new vocabulary today, so we're going to be doing some uh, fill in the blanks here. So the derivative of the derivative of f of x is called what? Anybody do the reading yet? Second the second derivative, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the derivative of the derivative of a function is called the second derivative. Come on, turn on. Oh, right, it's not on. Okay, sorry. Second derivative is just the derivative of the derivative. All right, so any of these notations can represent the second derivative. We can use two primes to mean the derivative of the derivative of f, which is the derivative of f prime. Or you can use y double prime. If you, write, if you wrote your equation y equals instead of f of x equals, you can do y double prime. Or you can use the Leibniz notation, which um, squares things. So we've got d squared dx squared of f of x or d squared y dx squared. Um, so the Leibniz notation makes sense if you remember that d dx means the derivative of. So I'm going to take d dx, the derivative of dy dx, which is the derivative of y with respect to x. And then you can kind of, we treat the um, variables like they're fractions, but it's not really true, but the notation works, so we go with it. So it's kind of like d times dy squared gives you the d squared y, and dx times dx gives you the dx squared. <clears throat> okay, so the second derivative measures how the rate of change is changing. Okay, so the first derivative measures the rate of change of a quantity, and the second derivative measures how the rate of change is changing. Equivalently, it measures how the derivative is changing. Equivalently, the second derivative measures how the slope of the original function is changing. So let's take a little look at uh, an animation. All right, so as I slide this point A, we're going to get values of the first derivative, which is the slope of the tangent line, and values of the second derivative, which tells you how that slope of the tangent line is changing. So my slope of my tangent line right now is positive, right? And it is approaching zero, right? Which means that it is decreasing, right? A positive slope to approaching zero means decreasing. A function that's decreasing should have a derivative that's what? Negative, yeah. So you can see that my, when my, as my first derivative decreases from something positive to zero, the second derivative is negative. So we go from zero, positive to zero, and then we get to zero, and my first derivative is going to become negative, and it's going to get more and more negative for a little while, which means that it's decreasing, right? The slope of my tangent lines are decreasing, so my second derivative should remain negative as my first derivative gets more and more negative. And then there's this point here where it's going to stop getting more negative, the first derivative, and it's going to start approaching zero. And when, when values are going from negative towards zero, they're increasing, which means that the derivative of the derivative should be positive. So I now have positive second derivative. And I hit zero. And my first derivative, the slopes of the tangent lines along here, are going to be positive, and they're going to get more and more and more positive, which means that the slopes of the tangent lines are increasing, which means my second derivative should be what? Positive, yeah. Oops. Positive. So the relationship between increasing and decreasing function and positive and negative derivative is really important. Um, and we're just applying it again to the derivative of the derivative. So we're looking at what's happening to the slope of the tangent line. If that slope is getting bigger, the second derivative should be positive. And if that slope is getting smaller, 
the second derivative should be negative. Okay, so you've seen the second derivative outside of class, um, outside of calculus class, maybe in another class, maybe on the news. So if we let f of t be the cost of a standard basket of goods and services, then f prime of t is the rate at which costs are changing as time passes. What is that called? The rate at which the cost of things changes. Inflation. Or I suppose deflation. Right, depending on if those prices are going up or down, we just are so used to them going up. So if f prime of t is positive, then costs are going which direction? Up, yeah. Positive derivative means an increasing function. And if f prime of t is negative, then costs are going down, right? Negative derivative means a decreasing function. And this is called deflation. If f prime of t equals 0, what's happening to costs? They're staying the same. So f double prime of t is the rate at which what is changing? Inflation. F double prime of t is the rate at which inflation is changing, right? So you might hear on the news the inflation is going up really fast, right? So inflation already is a rate of change, and we're talking about the rate of change of that rate of change. Okay, assuming we have inflation, because that is the most common case, so F prime is positive and F double prime is positive, then inflation is increasing, um, sorry, if that be, inflation f prime is positive. And then if f double prime is positive, inflation is increasing. And if f double prime is negative, then inflation is decreasing. Okay. In the last case, costs are still going up. We still have inflation. They're just not going up as fast. So this is a, um, a quote from Richard Nixon in, in the fall of 1972. He told the country that the rate of increase of inflation is decreasing. Um, believed to be the first time a sitting pres president referenced a third derivative in a nationwide address. The rate of increase of inflation is decreasing. So inflation itself is a derivative, right? It's a rate of change. And then he's talking about the rate of change of inflation, the rate of increase, that's F double prime. And then he's describing that as decreasing, which is F triple prime. So he's talking about triple derivative there. Okay, so let's fill in units for these um, last two applications of the second derivative. That's the inflation. Hold on. What were the last two applications? No. Oh, maybe F. Yeah, that could be. Did I talk about? Sure, we'll do that. We'll. Uh, <laughs> so if S of T is position, right? That's like sort of our most classic. We use we use S of T to represent position all the time. Then, um, what are my units on position? What is SI? Oh, I don't care. Just give me some position. Meters, sure. Right. And then when I take the derivative of position, what do I get? Velocity, which is meters per second. 
And then when I take the derivative of the derivative, the derivative of velocity gives me acceleration. And the units on that are meters per second per second, or meters per second squared. OK, so if F is representing the standard basket of goods and services, the cost of the standard basket of goods and services, what are my units on F? 13 monies? <laughs> How do you measure money? Dollars. Yeah. So my units there are dollars. What are my units on the derivative of that function? Dollars per year, yes, yeah, years. And then F double prime, what are its units? Dollars per year per year, yeah, dollars per year squared. Dollars per year per year. So it's always your Y units over your X units. So F double prime, Y units are dollars per year. And then the input units are time years. OK, so the four basic building blocks of almost every graph are here below, A, B, C, D. And uh, assuming each of the graphs below represent F of T, let's label each of the graphs with the sign of F prime and F double prime. Okay, so each of these graphs are an, are an F of T function. So since F is um, in A, F is increasing, right? And when you look at an increasing function, when you look at its tangent lines, what can you say about them, about their sign? Positive. So I know that F prime of T in this picture is positive. And then I want to look at what's happening to the slopes, right? They're not just positive, but they are getting steeper, right? which means that the derivative function is increasing. So what can I say about the second derivative function? It's positive, yeah. Increasing function has a positive derivative. So these slopes are increasing. They're getting steeper. So I'll write that out. I'm going to say f prime of t increasing. That tells us that F double prime of T is positive. OK, so let's look at um, B here. If I draw tangent lines on it, are they positive or negative? Negative. Okay. And any time you have a decreasing function like that, the tangent lines will be negative. So here I'm going to write f prime is negative. Now let's look at what's happening to the tangent lines, not just their sign, but what's happening to them. Are they increasing or decreasing? Are the slopes increasing or decreasing in value? They're decreasing. They start out negative, and then they get more and more negative. Right? So f prime is decreasing, which means that f double prime is negative. So I'll write, I'll write that out, too. f prime is decreasing. And that means you can conclude that f double prime is negative. All right, the function for C, f of t, is it an increasing or a decreasing function, the original function? Decreasing, which means without having to draw the tangent lines, what can you say about its derivative? Yes, less than 0, it's negative. Yep. So I can say f prime of t is negative because f is decreasing. And you can always draw the tangent lines to remind yourself, oh yeah, those are definitely negative slopes. But then I'm going to look at those, what's happening to those slopes. 
right? The value of the slope of each of those tangent lines, as I read from left to right, they start out negative and pretty steep, and they're always negative, but what are they approaching? Zero. They're getting less and less steep. They're approaching zero, which means the value of the slopes are increasing or decreasing? Increasing. Negative towards zero is increasing. So if f prime is increasing, f prime is increasing, then what does that tell me about f double prime? It is positive. Good. Increasing function has a positive derivative. So if f prime is increasing, the derivative of f prime, which is f double prime, is positive. All right, one more. The function uh, for, for d there, f is increasing or decreasing? Increasing, which means that f prime is positive. f increasing implies f prime is positive. And then I'm going to look at those tangent lines, my slopes. What's happening to the slopes of the tangent lines? They're decreasing. They start out, they're all positive. They start out pretty steep, and then they're approaching zero. So the values of the slopes is decreasing. So I have f prime decreasing. That tells me that f double prime is what? Negative. Good. So those are basically the four building blocks of every graph. We have increasing and decreasing. And each of those, increasing and decreasing, has two flavors, bending up and bending down. Right? So A and D are both increasing, but A is sort of bent upwards, and D is sort of bent downwards. And both B and C are decreasing, but B is sort of bent down, and C is sort of bent up. And those bends <clears throat> are known as the different concavity of the functions. So um, note that if a function can hold water like a cup, then it's concave up. And if it looks like a frown, it's concave down. Okay, so this first one, we would say, is concave up everywhere. Right? The second one, concave down everywhere. And then the third one, what would you say about that one? Concave up, concave down. Yeah, concave down before x equals 2 and concave up after. So we would write that as an interval. I would say concave down on the interval negative infinity to 2 and concave up on the interval 2 to infinity. And I didn't include the 2 in either of my endpoints because it's sort of neither concave up or concave down there. It's, it's switching concavity at that very point. OK, so for each of the four building blocks, we want to choose two phrases, increasing, decreasing, concave up, concave down. So we'll go back to the four building blocks. A, increasing or decreasing? Increasing, concave up or concave down? Concave up. So this one we have increasing, concave up. How about B? Decreasing, concave down. And C, what do you think? Decreasing, concave up. Yeah, it's definitely decreasing. We read it from left to right, and it's cold water like a cup. So this is decreasing and concave up. And then the last one, increasing, concave down.
Okay, so this is really important. We've been using this a lot today. If f prime is positive, what can you say about the graph of the original function f? Kind of going backwards here. Increasing, yeah. We, a lot of, many times today we've been saying if f is increasing, f prime is positive, the reverse is true. If f prime is positive, then the graph of f is increasing. And if f prime is negative, the graph of f is decreasing. Okay. If f prime is positive, if f double prime is positive, what can you say about the graph of f? Go back up to my pictures. In the two cases where f double prime was positive, it's concave up. Yeah. In A and C, I had f double prime positive leads to concave up. And if f double prime is negative, then the graph of f is concave down. What kind of graph has f double prime equal to 0? A straight line a no, uh, that has no concavity. Right? Because um, you can think of it graphically. It has no curve to it, which means it has no concavity. So its second derivative can't be positive or negative. It has to be 0. Or you can think of it as the rate of change of the rate of change is 0. Right? And the rate of change of a line is constant. And the rate of change of a constant is 0 because it doesn't change. It's constant. <clears throat> Okay, so label these graphs with their concavity. Give your answers in inter interval notation. Just take two minutes or so, do that. Okay, so for 1 over x, where is it concave down? Negative infinity to 0. So concave down, negative infinity to 0. And then it's concave up from 0 to infinity. So just like with increasing and decreasing, you explain where a function is concave up and where it's concave down by giving x values only, intervals of x values. <clears throat> All right, so for the tangent of x, where is it concave down? on a repeating period. Yeah. Is it negative 2? What is, what is this value for tangent x where its asymptote is? Negative pi over 2. Yeah. And then the next time that it's, there's an asymptote here. So it's going to be negative pi over 2 to 0, right, concave down. And then pi over 2 to pi. So yeah, negative pi over 2 to 0, and so negative pi over 2, and then it happens again at pi over 2. So it's every pi, right? So plus pi n comma 0 plus pi n is where it's concave down. And then concave up everywhere else. Um, 0 to pi over 2, and that's going to repeat every pi. So 0 plus pi n, comma pi over 2 plus pi n. And n, n is just um, stands for every integer or every natural number. So you can plug in, this is n equals 0, you'd get 0 to pi over 2. For n equals 1, you'd get pi to 3 pi over 2. You just keep plugging in the different integers. So this is how you explain that I'm going to write all the intervals out. <clears throat> OK. 
Okay, so if, it, if the concavity of a graph changes at a point, so we're using this as our example to think about what happens when concavity changes. So in this example, the concavity changed from down to up at 0. And what was true about the function f at x equals 0? Undefined. Yeah, it has dis discontinuity, undefined, right? And then here, when tangent changed from concave down to concave up, what, um, what was true about f of 0? It's zero. Uh, yes, it is zero. F of zero is zero. Um, let's think about the derivatives of tangent x. So when you're concave down, what do you say about the second derivative? When a, it's negative. Yeah, when a function's concave down, the second derivative is negative. So concave down, negative. Concave up, second derivative is positive. So the second derivative changed from negative to positive, and it was continuous, right? So you remember that, that theorem we talked about a few days ago, um, the intermediate value theorem? So f prime is continuous, and it switches from negative to positive, which means it has to go through zero. So either when a function changes, from con changes concavity, either the second derivative is zero, or maybe it's undefined at that point. And since derivatives are so much fun, there's nothing stopping us from going past the second derivative. The derivative of the second derivative is the third derivative. And we use the same kind of notation. You use 3 primes, f triple prime or y triple prime, or d cubed dx cubed of f of x, or d cubed y over dx cubed. So the third derivative of the position function, that's the derivative of acceleration, is called the jerk or the jolt. Um, when you suddenly wake up after you feel like you're falling, that's a myoclonic jerk. It's like when you accelerate really fast, you kind of feel yourself go like that. That's, that's described by the third derivative. So notationally, all those primes can get unwieldy. So after the third derivative, we stop just putting primes, and we put a little number 4. Instead of putting like 8 primes, we put a little 8. <clears throat> all right, so you have some work to do. For each of these functions, we need to determine on what intervals of x the derivative is positive and negative, and the second derivative is positive and negative. So that's 1 through 4. And then 5 and 6, you have to sketch some functions that meet these criteria. So these are, these are tricky, and they'll take a while to get used to. Um, you do have the answers, and I will be walking around and helping you discuss them with your groups.